Okay. Do you mind if I record? Oh, by all okay. means, go ahead. <laughs> and I don't know. Feel free if you need to repeat the question for your transcript, or I can just jump right in and answer. It's up to you. <laughs> okay. Thanks. I'll probably repeat the question. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, but um, in the digital writing workshop that you published in 2009, you wrote, if we engage students in real writing tasks and we use technology in such a way that it complete complements their innate need to find purposes and audiences for their work, we can have them engaged in a digital writing process that focuses first on the writer, then on the writing, and lastly on the technology. I adore all of this, especially the last part. And I'm wondering if your thought process has changed or expanded at all since you wrote it it would probably be disingenuous to say my thought process hasn't changed a little bit. Um, and yet at the core, I think I still am pretty strictly an adherent to that idea of, you know, building off the Lucy Calkins idea of teach the writer, not the writing, and then layer the technology on at the end. I, I would say I still believe that pretty firmly. And maybe there's a little bit of an ebb and flow in there where I wouldn't always say that you have to wait and teach the technology last. In fact, I think there are times where it can be useful to teach the technology and give people that experience to play and to try things and say this is a low risk, no grades, no worries, we're just trying this out right now uh, type of situation as compared to you know, let's only wait and do technology at the end. Um, I kind of learned that strategy from one of my friends and colleagues at our writing project, um, Penny Liu, because she would have her students do digital stories, but before she had them create digital stories, she would just have them pick a simple nursery rhyme and do the nursery rhyme in the timeline, put the pictures in and put the music in and record their voice and all that stuff. So they felt like it was a really low pressure situation. And, I, and I've used that move in my own teaching and in workshops and things like that. And then the other piece too, is that I, I think even since 2009, a lot has changed in the sense that things are cloud-based, they're kind of saved constantly. Um, so it's okay like to, to try things um, and you won't break it. But on the flip side, I would also say, you know, there are times where I will very often say, um, you know, we're going to create a digital story or a website or a presentation. And I want you to shut your laptop lid or put your tablet away or, you know, just put your phone away, whatever, grab a piece of paper and let's draw or let's write and let's imagine what this could look like um, before we actually start trying to create it on screen. So I think focusing on audience and purpose is still very, very uh, important. And even especially, you know, for young kids who know how to click buttons and push and make things happen on the screen, I think that um, helping them step back from it once in a while and thinking a little more intentionally about what it is that they're trying to design and what it is they're trying to do can be really important. So, so in general, yes, I would say I still pretty firmly believe those things, though I, I you know, kind of ebb and flow a little bit on it. I think it depends on the context and the situation um, for the teaching. Yeah, that's great, thank you. Mm -hmm. And then in your next book, in 2013, you published Crafting Digital Writing, Composing Texts Across Media and Genres. And you wrote, while the hype about 21st century literacies may sometimes be overwhelming, these digital literacy, th these digital skills, sorry, and the habits of mind they foster have become, at the very least, a pointed topic in our current discussions of educational practice and policy, and at best, a way for students to truly understand what it means to be literate in their ever more digital world. So a lot has changed even in these past five years. And mm -hmm. so if you were to write a second edition of this book, which Heineman probably will have you do, um, would you revise the statement? Yeah, so I think part of the process that's changed, um, and in some ways, I, again, like I, I just saw a title for an article. I can't remember who wrote it, but it was like, you know, what's new in new literacies? Well, really, you know, same as it ever was, right? Like, yeah, now we just acknowledge that the visual has always been a part of literacy, at least in the last 10 to 20 years. But anyway, the point with this being that, you know, I think the touch screen has done something um, in the ubiquity of touch screens. And I know there are still access and equity issues for 
many children in many schools. And yet at the same time, we can't ignore the fact that, you know, according to Pew Internet, I think the last report I saw was like over 75% of teenagers have their own device that they carry with them almost all the time. So the fact that they have that and they can quickly add captions and add filters and, um, you know, circulate things on social media, there has been a bit of a change even since 2013. And so I think what I would be looking at more now would be to say, again, like, okay, what are the times and the places where kids are just putting on a filter or putting on a caption or putting on a funny little puppy face or something on a picture or as compared to the times where they're actually engaged in a thoughtful, sustained writing process. And that thoughtful, sustained writing process may only be two or three minutes long, but at least it's longer than, oh, I'm snapping a picture, putting a filter on it and sending it out. It might even be with that same picture and maybe you send it this way with this filter to this one friend, but you send it this way with a different filter to a different friend and you pause long enough to think about that. So I think the tools, even though they become, you know, push and play now um, and make it very, very easy. I think that we want to continually help kids understand that there's a design process. There's a writing process that goes into this. There's choices that you're making uh, why are you making these choices in, in different contexts for different audiences? Um, I'm not sure if I fully answered your question. I feel like I strayed a little bit there. <laughs> yeah, but. no, but it was really, it was, it's good. Okay, good. I, I just, yeah, I think the, it's interesting. The ubiquity and the ease of the touch screen definitely changes kind of the cognitive process that as compared to just keyboarding and clicking on a mouse. So. Right. And of course, you hear these stories now. Teachers who have, you know, their kindergartners come to school and they go down to the computer lab, and these kids have never touched a mouse before. Like they're pointing at the screen, and they 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 don't know what a mouse is. So yeah, I, as a librarian, I have a self check in check out station, and they still need a mouse. And so it's I'm constantly teaching kindergarten, first and second graders how to how to do it. Yeah. But next year, hopefully, it'll be easier because yeah. <laughs> they'll know. And so I'm going to skip my questions a little bit and go to, so do you think that the technology has changed teachers' writing practice in the sense that the writing workshop versus traditional old school non-writing workshop? For instance, do you think writing workshop teachers stop using the writing workshop when they adopted technology and vice versa? Do you think teachers who never used the writing workshop started to use it once they adopted using technology? That's a really good question. So I, I wish I could like point to some statistical analysis that says of the 100,000, you know, language arts teachers that we surveyed, you know, X number said they use writing workshop method and da, 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 da. Yeah. I don't know of a particular study that does that. Maybe if you run across one, I'd be curious to see it. I know Appleby and Langer did a lot of work trying to survey what kinds of writing were happening and even then, I don't know if they got to that fine grain detail of like interviewing teachers and finding all those things out. So first of all, I think it's hard to quantify like how many teachers are using writing workshop. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. Katie Wood Ray has that great passage at the beginning of one of her books where she talks about, are you using the writing workshop or are you using the writing pro are you using the writing process or are you using the writing workshop? And I think that many teachers, you know, high quality, thoughtful, caring, wonderful teachers, teachers that I know and collaborate with would say, oh yeah, I'm doing a writing workshop. But what they're really doing is writing process on individual pieces. And they're kind of pushing kids through all those pieces at the same time. So the extent to which technology does or doesn't change that, I think is hard to measure in, in a couple ways. One is, if you're going to, and I'm being a little sarcastic here, but if you're going to go from, you know, brainstorming on Monday to final draft Friday, does it really matter whether or not you're using paper and pencil or whether you're using Google Drive? You're still kind of pushing them through this, you know, somewhat inauthentic process. Um, at the same time, if you're using Google Drive, at least that gives you this opportunity to perhaps engage them in some collaboration and peer response and, um, for you to look at it and give them some feedback and for them to give feedback to one another a little bit better than what you would normally get on paper. But then you have that 
flip side of, oh, well, I'll give them comments on, you know, type them in the comments in the margin. I'm not actually having that one-to-one -one interaction or, you know, that one-to-one -one interaction is really, really tiny. Um, so then are you using technology in a way like, oh, I can use Kaizen and I can record my voice and I can give them voice feedback that I, I couldn't, I couldn't get to all 30 of them in the classroom. I can only do that. You know, I can get to five or 10 of them in any one day and then I'll get the rest of them online at night and I'll give them a little bit of feedback that way. Um, so I think, you know, as with everything, like our, our really thoughtful 5% bleeding edge innovative teachers who are going to try all kinds of new strategies and technologies, it's probably made a difference for them. I think technology really makes a difference for them and they're able to communicate with their students in all kinds of different ways. Um, for that next part of the bell curve, you know, the 20% ish, I think it's probably, I think technology has probably had a generally positive impact on their work. Um, and again, this is not to be disparaging towards the broad swath of K-12 education, right. but with institutional, you know, an assessment and bureaucratic overlays on top of everything that they have to do and lack of access, Wi-Fi is down, machines are broken, then they're dealing with, you know, transiency and absences and things like that. I mean, it's just hard. It's it, it's just simply hard for them to do that. And I completely understand. So I don't know that I have a really solid answer to say, yes, technology has absolutely changed the writing workshop in these particular ways. I could point you to a couple of teachers that I think are doing it in really smart ways. And you could talk with them too, and they could probably give you some more specific insights. Um, but I don't know that the revolution that we were aiming for, we're always aiming for the revolution in education, right? I just, I don't know that it's fully come and I don't, I don't know that it will actually in writing workshop. Right. I, I'm, I'm a little, I guess, surprised in some ways that like more hasn't happened, that we aren't having more kids using technology on a regular basis in more innovative ways. Um, like my own children in their own school district, like we live in a pretty good school district and they're still writing five paragraph essays in middle school and high school, oh, you know, that's got to kill you. Oh, it does. It does. But I, you know, I can't put that on my kids. Like I don't, I don't have my, I don't tell them like, you got to go back and tell your teachers how terrible they are. And I'm not going to go in and, you know, make a scene and all that kind of stuff. But yeah, if I have opportunity on occasion to talk to one of their teachers in a semi-professional and yet still casual way, I'll say, tell me a little bit more about what you're doing and why, have you thought about this? Have you thought about that? I don't do it at open house night and I may or may not do it during parent teacher conferences, but I might do it at a basketball game or yeah. if I see them in the grocery store. So again, that was a long convoluted answer to your question. I, I guess my bottom line is that there are some things I wish technology would encourage and allow and help us do better with writing workshop. And I don't think that's as evenly distributed and happening in the ways that we would want it to. Um, I don't think it would take a whole lot to, to really turn a lot of people on to using digital portfolios and giving voice comments and feedback and having them create multimedia but again, all those institutional bureaucratic constraints where they feel like they've got to do. Oh, I'm losing you a little bit. Oh, okay. Oh, hopefully oh. I'm back. <laughs> yes, you are back. Sorry. Okay. Yep. That happens sometimes. In Zoom, so. <laughs> um, something random is I teach, so I'm a product of the um, UNH writing institutes and so I teach a class now and my passion and what I want my dissertation research to be on is blending the best practices of technology with literacy and so my class I think was blending the best practices of connected learning with the writing workshop and Lisa Miller who Tom Newkirk has as you know retired and so Lisa Miller took over and she's like I don't want the writing workshop title in there at all <laughs> what like that's 
that's we are who we are because of the writing workshop like what and she's like well I think it will turn off some people from taking this course because they may not use the writing workshop but so I'm just trying to so I still can't believe some people don't teach the writing workshop I know I'm well aware it doesn't happen I was hoping that by teaching this class that maybe they want to get into technology but they could also get into that so I mean I still I just Mm -hmm. change the title of the course that's it but um so i'm just it's 2017 how do we all not know about the writing workshop <laughs> and, and i want technology to help uh, that. yeah yeah it's kind of hard to believe i mean one of the ways that i've started maybe thinking about it from a slightly different perspective like you know you have these like um writing next reports and you have the institute of educational sciences and what works clearinghouse have put out their reports about like best practices evidence-based best practices and in writing instruction and i'm like i start saying like here we know like <laughs> we can do the research says because this is like statistically quantifiable evidence that says these things work and oh look they all happen to fit within writing workshop pedagogy so again are you just teaching the writing process and are you doing it in this disjointed manner and maybe you'll get some success or are you going to put all this together and take it in a workshop approach and really give kids some flexibility and freedom and again that's hard it's hard for people to give up flexibility and freedom in or to in, include flexibility and freedom you know i was reviewing some curriculum recently that is ostensibly workshop based and Yes, it is. And yes, it in, integrates best practices. And yet at the same time, every day is just moving them through this process that they have to get to at the end. And so I don't know. I, I don't know. I don't know how to solve this problem. It's one I'm sure that you and I and others have been wrestling with for many, many years. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Um, so most of your work, am I, am I correct to, um, think that most of your work beyond or before the university level was middle school writing mm -hmm. okay and so do your theories of blending writing workshop with technology align with elementary school writing if not how are they different yeah i would hope so especially for upper elementary school and the teachers i've talked with and worked with generally seem to think that um you know especially by about third grade you know you do have students hopefully able to start producing paragraphs and entire stories and entire essays and things like that and also have the capabilities of you know understanding the internet and what a hyperlink is and how to embed an image and do those types of things and certainly creating their own presentations and even starting to make movies and things like that um for the younger ones i'm keenly keenly aware that there are some core literacy competencies that young ones need to have everything from phonemic awareness to fine motor skills to you know uh, an understanding of text and you know print awareness and all those types of things and so people have asked like well should we be using ipads in kindergarten should we not well you know as with most things in education i don't think there's any one single answer but I can tell you how I wouldn't use iPads in or in kindergarten, and that would be to have a kid sitting there taking a phonics quiz or have a kid sitting there, you know, underline the verb. And you can, I mean, you can Google it and you can find all these websites, right, of these grammar games and this kind of stuff. I'm like, we know that stuff doesn't work, and it definitely will not work for kids in elementary school. So have them become creators, not consumers. And um, so also to the extent that I try to focus my work and be very um, principles and practice based and not simply, you know, technology based, like, oh, do, do this with this program. It's more, oh, what would you want to accomplish as a writer? Let's think about how we could use this program or this app or this website to accomplish that. So I would like to think that those ideas translate to the lower grades too. And yeah, I've seen some pretty cool projects. I mean, you know, I've seen the ways that kids create their own digital books and create digital stories and 
um, can do some pretty creative and innovative work. Um, do I still want my child or any child to be able to pick up a pencil or a pen and handwrite and create their own text on paper? Absolutely. They have to have those skills too. Um, but we should give them opportunities to do these other types of uh, digital literacy skills as well. Absolutely. So I want to pick your brain about my research ideas. Mm -hmm. um, I, I was a fifth grade teacher for 10 years and that's, that's my grade. <laughs> I just, I love it. Um, and so I was thinking of doing research in three through five, but then now I'm thinking of um, finding three schools in New Hampshire. Even though I teach in Burlington Public Schools, I'm going to school in New Hampshire. I live in New Hampshire. I taught in New Hampshire. And um, so I think that's where I want to do most of my work. And um, I want to find yeah, three different schools. One school will have used the writing workshop model for at least six years. So to ensure that um, these kids have used the writing project since kindergarten, um, the writing mm -hmm. workshop since kindergarten. And the school can use technology to type work, but they don't have things like their own blog. And um, mm -hmm. they don't just, they only use technology to type. So basic, just mm -hmm. hardcore writing workshop. And I don't think I want to use Lucy Calkins just because I, and I, and I love, I've read all of her work. I love her mm -hmm. work, but I just, I love the organic sense of teachers who have the flexibility to teach, find every kid's own approximate development and find out where their class is and all that jazz. But um, maybe I'll go, we'll see in my research mm -hmm. that I find. And then, so the second school would be, um, they don't use the writing workshop at all, but they use technology strongly for the kids each have their own blog. And um, then the third school would be, ideally, the kids would use the writing workshop as since kindergarten, as well as have their own blog. And um, so I'm, uh, I, my idea is to hire classroom teachers to blindly assess student writing. And I was going to have them um, just collect maybe two classes in every school of fifth grade of probably argument essay, which would be the easiest. I, I don't know. I'm definitely going to ask you what you think of this. And then have my friends assess it. I'll probably use Lucy Calkins' rubric because it's so it's extensive and research-based. And I don't want to recreate that when it's already works really well. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's it. Like, do you think I should use more than one genre? Do you, what do you think? Yeah, so I definitely like the design in the way that you're trying to get multiple sites and even multiple pieces of writing from kids, maybe at, you know, the early part of the year and the ending part of the year. Yes. Um, I have a kind of a quick question for you, like, to what extent, if at all, um, do you want to try to tie what you're seeing in the kids writing to the practices in the classroom? Are you going to be observing, taking field notes, are you going to be filming, are you going to be interviewing the teachers, like, what, what, what's that other side of it look like? Right, well I want to, well it's hard to get past the IRB to interview kids, although I'm, I'm going to attack that as well, mm -hmm. to see um, what they're learning and their goals are, and um, absolutely I'd want to, I'd want to do extensive research to find the right teachers in the first place because I don't want to get halfway through my research and have them do the beginning work and to find out that these teachers aren't one of the classifications that I want them to be. And then, but definitely having um, focus groups and being able to, to be in there. And I can't spend a lot of time in the classrooms because I still have a full-time job that I don't okay. want to leave. Mm -hmm. But I sure. plan, uh, my, my principal is really cool and flexible, so I'd be able to spend some time within the classrooms. Cool, cool. So, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, you know, figuring out, I want to say, like, comparing apples to apples in the sense that, are you are you going to be asking them all to do the same prompt, or are you just going to take something generally of the same genre? Yeah, I, I'm anti-prompts and okay. so I would definitely want to make it'd be a lot easier to have a prompt obviously but I want it to be organic work I don't want kids to have to do a, a special writing assignment just for me and so I think in the fifth grade that New Hampshire falls the common core except for mm -hmm. one city 
And um, so I would just, they all have to write argument essays. So I was thinking like, since they're gonna be taught it anyways to have a writing sample of that, of their final piece. And then the idea with having them blog is because, so when I taught fifth grade, my kids would write whatever they want on their blog. Well, with when reason I use kid blog and I made mm -hmm. sure it was appropriate and safe and kind before they were able to publish it. But then also they were, they published their work that we did fully through the writing workshop. Well, everything we went through the process writing and because kids had an authentic audience, then mm -hmm. I like their work in December was as good as it was in June before blogging and kids like I hate football, but my fifth grade boys love football and that's all they would write about. <laughs> and like people right. all over the country would write to write comments on that. And so they, they would write on weekends and vacations and in the summer for a couple of years after mm -hmm. they were in my class. And I just think that's the magic of technology of them having that authentic audience. Fun, fun. Yeah, and that actually gets to what I was gonna ask you. So you're gonna have the writing samples. Are you gonna try to do any kind of self-efficacy like survey or anything or have them even write something about their self-efficacy as writers? Um, do you plan to connect it to that in any way? I hadn't thought of that, but I think that's a great idea. Okay, because I, I mean, to me, this is like the, the curious part, right? Like everyone, the problem is always, oh, let's add technology, it's gonna make it more engaging, they'll be more engaged, da, 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 da. well, sometimes that works, sometimes it doesn't, and it's that secret sauce that happens with the technology and the teacher and the teaching methods and all those types of things. So let's say, for instance, you know, you get your results back and you're like, oh, okay, well, in the beginning of the year, my technology using teacher um, hadn't introduced the class blog yet and their narratives were okay but then by the end of the year they did their arguments and they were much better well what happened in the in between time is kind of what you want to hear and like hearing from the teacher as well as from the kids what how do they feel about themselves as writers what are the skills that they've learned how does technology contribute and again recognizing your time and energy and constraints and things like that how you know getting a survey of 30 kids is different than interviewing three kids three times over the year and all those things but i think somehow tying the achievement on the writing to the self-efficacy piece and then starting to tease that apart and saying well was it writing workshop was it this particular charismatic teacher uh, was it the fact that they published to a blog? Was it, you know, like, what are the threads that start to hold all that together? And, you know, how, how do the kids talk about it? Like, do they, do they talk about writing? And you know this from your own experience, that they talk about it in a very perfunctory, kind of meaningless, schooly way, like, oh, this is something I have to get done? Or do they talk like they're a writer? Like, do they really embody what it means to be a writer? And then how did they talk about the technology and the genre and the audience and all those kinds of things. So yeah. if there's a way to do, to get something from them, that's more than just the pieces of writing, I think that would really add value to the work you're, you're trying to do. I love that. Thank yeah. you, Troy. That's, yeah. that's priceless. Yeah. Yeah. And again, I mean, I'm recognizing your constraints and, that you know let's just say like you're able to visit each classroom once in the fall visit each classroom again once in the winter and once in the spring mm -hmm. you know that's hard like to say even three times like oh i went in i interviewed these two kids these three times like to to show change in a qualitative sense even i think a lot of qualitative researchers eh, you didn't if you're trying to really make the point that this kid changed or is more improved as a writer, you know, so you might just be better off saying, I'm just going to do a survey. <laughs> I'm going to do a survey yeah. in September and a survey in May. Um, probably try to get the kids, you know, track the kids in terms of giving them a code name or, a, you know, so you can maybe do some basic, you know, correlation type stuff and then say, oh, and here is their performance on this piece in the fall and their performance on the piece in the spring. Um, I, I don't know. 
Yeah, I, someone that does more with that type of research would probably be better to answer that question than I am, but hopefully that helps. <laughs> it definitely helps. Thank you yeah, so much. For sure. And then do you think I'm wrong to connect, like I'm so focused, hyper-focused on blogging. There's so many aspects of technology, but I think that I just need to narrow it down and have a common denominator. Mm -hmm. So when I refer to a certain, I pick my school that doesn't use the writing workshop, but uses technology and then my school that uses both, I'm mm -hmm. just going to focus on the, and my network, my PLN, try to, because I think I'm going to have a hard time finding these schools. Um, just, I think that's what my focus is on would be blogging. Does that seem okay? Yeah. So again, not to be the wishy-washy academic, but to actually turn that's this, need. <laughs> turn this back on you and ask you a question. So tell me, tell me about blog, how do I want to phrase this? Tell me about blogging, both from kind of the technical sense, like what is blogging, but then also from a more rhetorical sense, like, so tell me about the technical stuff of blogging, like what are the buttons that need to be clicked and, and what constitutes a, a blog post. But then I want to hear more of kind of the audience and purpose and genre. And things. So start with the technical stuff. So when you say blogging, what do you, what do you mean when you say blogging? I mean, every kid has his or her own blog. It's not a class blog where a blogger where kids can post to the class. It's they have like Sean's blog and okay. it's he can own it. And yes, the teacher has controls to make sure all comments and posts are appropriate prior to, I think that's really important for especially elementary school to be able to, um, of course we're gonna teach them how to, what's appropriate for blogging, but just to make sure they're not posting their address or something that would freak parents out. Um, <laughs> that's my number one concern is just parents can get scared about this stuff, which I understand. Mm -hmm. And then, um, so kids would have their own blog. I really like kid blog from that. And I love, I'm a Google certified trainer, so I want to use Google, but they don't make it possible to give kids their own blog and teachers control. It's like, I've begged them to change that, but they haven't, they probably won't. Mm -hmm. And um, so just, yes, the technical point, the kid has their own blog. They write at weekends, nights, not just at school. And then they can put their assignments on if they wish. It's kind of like the digital portfolio idea. I don't want to tell kids what is an artifact for them. I want them so they are not forced to write their, put any of their responses to literature or their, any of the genres we do in writing, but they, they post what they want. Sometimes they did, sometimes they didn't. Mm -hmm. So what constitutes a, a good blog post from one of your kids? Like what, what are you looking for them to do as a writer? Some, to publish something that they're really passionate about, where they have huge voice about it, and also something that they have an open mind where they realize that they'll have a real audience, and their audience can push their thinking deeper and ask questions. And so, so I think it's also, I love kids blogging with other kids in the class and with other schools, and then with the, especially with the adults, when the adults say, I noticed one thing, just one positive comment and then one constructive comment to push their thinking deeper. Okay. So again, yeah. So, and I'm asking you to kind of tease this apart a little bit. So like you've okay. talked about like two technical aspects. One is where the locus of control is and whether it's under a teacher's full management, the class blog, as you said, as compared to your blog. <laughs> Um, and how things get published and when they get published and so forth. And then also this feature of commenting and, and then both of those have all those kind of rhetorical and audience aspects. Like the one that's really interesting for me about blogging is thinking too about um, like when do you take other people's stuff and put it on your blog either by literally copying and pasting text or in the case of Tumblr, like reblogging or taking a YouTube video and embedding it or taking a social media thing and embedding it. And then, you know, how deep does the conversation go after that? Like where, so it's on one level, it's like just about a, an issue of like copyright and fair use and how people live on the internet and how they communicate. But then at another level, it's like, 
how substantive are you being and at what level are you communicating and thinking about this? And are you linking just one thing or are you linking to three things? And if you're linking to three things, what kinds of things are you linking to? And um, maybe you don't link to them all in one post. Maybe you write five posts over a month and you link to different things. And, and so all those features that on the surface are just like, well, yeah, you can include a hyperlink. Well, of course it's, it's a blog. Of course you can include a hyperlink, but at a, at a deeper level, it's asking these questions about, again, who are you writing for? What do you want them to know? Where do you, how do you want to position yourself as a blogger? Who do you want to align with? Like all those types of things. So yeah, I like what you said about like the control of the blog, the circulating and the commenting, thinking about just what features they use, whether they actually do embed media and embed links. I think all of those could be really interesting questions too. Yes. So, no, that's great. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. So, so at, at risk of maybe trying to put a little, put a little wet towel on your, on your multi-class <laughs> study here, <laughs> why, why not just study one class that's using them? Why not find the teacher that you think is doing something pretty unique with blogging and, and take a deeper look at that? Because how that would be, I think a lot easier, more manageable, but then how would I compare if it's effect more effective than one or the other? So I just like the idea of, and then if I could find, I've done a lot of research and started my lit review and trying to find those, I would love some other teacher to have already done the work of the school, the, the classroom that doesn't use technology or the classroom that doesn't use the writing workshop and uses technology. And there's been, there's a lot of yucky dissertations out there that don't have a lot of substance to them. And they just, I just don't know how they've gotten them passed. So I feel like I, since the work hasn't been done to answer my question, is it because I'm so adamant that blending the writing workshop with technology is beneficial. Um, I just want to be able to prove that. Mm -hmm. And I guess I, I guess I can, no, oh, go ahead. Oh no, I totally get it. And I mean, from, from thinking like as an academic trying to make a, an argument and saying, Hey, I actually did compare this class to this class and I've got, here are the scores. Here's what happened. I guess a little bit of a shortcut. I wouldn't call it cheating. It's just a shortcut. It's just to say, yeah, we have the NAEP data. We have our state test result data. We know that students that typically are in this kind of school with this kind of socioeconomic class are going to perform in this manner on this type of standardized test or writing assignment. Here's the data, right? Like 57% right. you know, of these fifth graders on any typical year are going to be proficient at writing their argument essay. I went and looked at, you know, Mrs. Jones and was following how she was using blogging to see what would happen with her students. Her students are demographically similar to all the other students in the district, blah, 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 aligns with the test scores. Blah, blah, blah. Let's, let's follow her for a year. And then, and then you're, you're delving in and you're, you're, taking, you're dipping and taking those samples of the student writing, following them for self-efficacy, really closely looking at a couple students along the way. And then at the end of the year, you're going to get their test scores too. And you can say, Hey, let's look and see, did they do any better or worse than what all these other teachers in New Hampshire are doing? Yes, they did. Or no, they didn't. Or, Hey, actually there was no difference. And at the end of the day, here's how all these kids felt about themselves as writers. So yes. I would just throw that out there for you. I mean, that's a move that academics may, and, and you know, as someone who's not a quantitative researcher, that's why I appreciate quantitative research because I can go to those other experts and say, here are the people that have done the hardcore quantitative randomly controlled statistically valid useful stuff. I'm going to take my hunch that I have and I'm going to build off of what they, you know, so for what it's worth, I mean, I would just say, and I know you're not at that stage yet and you've got plenty of time to think about it and all that kind of good stuff, but you know, just don't, don't paint yourself into a corner with your dissertation thinking, Oh, I have to do X, Y, and Z because if I don't, then, you know, anyway, that was my long 
roundabout way of saying that, you know, doing a deep qualitative study can, and you're right, there are some pretty yucky dissertations. There are some pretty yucky articles that make it to journals and conferences and everything else too. So you don't want to do a yucky qualitative study, but you, there, there's room to do a really good qualitative study. So. Right. No, oh, that's great. And I'm starting my quantitative course. I, I took qualitative a year ago, but I'm starting quant this weekend. And I'm, so my professor's going to, he said he's willing to work with me on my ideas too. So mm -hmm. I'll have some. Yeah. And, and I don't want to dissuade you from it. I mean, I think that there is value in doing that too. It's just what it is you're really looking for. If you're, if all you're, if you're going to go collect all that data from those other teachers and invite your friends over and buy them dinner and wine and spend a whole Saturday grading papers and, you know, yeah. crunching all those numbers. Why are you doing it? Like, could you get that same data from the, the NAEP scores or from New Hampshire's own test scores? just kind of think rhetorically about what you're using that for and how it fits into your overall arc of your dissertation. Because if you could spend your time doing other things that would A, be more fun, <laughs> and B, um, you know, be more useful. Yeah. Sorry, totally unsolicited advice. But. No, I so appreciate it. You probably saved a year of my life. Yeah. <laughs> my well, sanity. Oh, <laughs> well, yeah. And, you know, at the end of the semester, you can email me back and go, no, nope, Troy, I really thought about it, and I'm going to do this. And I'm, hey, cool. I, yeah. Hmm. Probably not. <laughs> so that, that's why um, I this assignment is to find our gurus and see hmm. what they think. Yeah. I mean, I think what it comes down to for me, right, is that, yeah, I don't, I don't want to be the tech guy that goes, oh, let's have kids blog. Woohoo. They're going to be so engaged. And, and this is not to say negative things about like people on kind of the ed tech circuit of the conferences, right? But maybe you've seen these people at conferences before or whatnot. And, and, have good ideas and whatnot, but it's like, that's the end of it. Like, oh, let's have kids blog. It's going to get them so engaged. And it's like, no, <laughs> let's think about why we're doing that. And it goes back to the quote of mine that you pulled, like, what do we want them to do and become as writers? And then what do we want them to be able to do as technicians? Yeah, they can insert a link. Yeah, they can insert a video. They can insert a photo or they can put a comment on someone else's blog. But if they're if they're not doing that for a real thoughtful, authentic purpose, then why do it in the first place? So. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, that's great. Yeah. Well, yeah. did you have other questions or thing? I feel like I I've answered and then I go way off over here. <laughs> no, I love it. Um, so thank you for your suggestions with Frankie Cyberson and Megan Block. I'm going to reach out to them as well. Mm -hmm. And then I have some unrelated questions about your writing project, just because I'm the, I, to pay for my doctorate, I am the um, grad assistant for Meg Peterson, who is the director of the New Hampshire Writing Project. Cool. And so, um, how are you doing with all these national changes that have recently come up? Yeah, so it's kind of hard. Um, yeah. I mean, I, forgive me, I don't want to, like, underestimate what you already do or don't know, but how, how long have you been involved with the writing project? Like what's your, just give me a little sense of your history so I don't like repeat myself or make it all. Okay, um, since I've been involved since June and Meg has shared with me that the national funding is being completely yeah. demolished. Okay. okay. It's heartbreaking. Yeah, so kind of the, the trajectory of that was, you know, in the late 80s, early 90s, they got the sustained funding for about 20 years. In 2011, they took one pivot because the Senate said no more earmarks. And that's when that first round of funding got cut. And then since 2011, it's been this whole let's get this grant. Okay, now we got this grant. We'll distribute it to local sites. Oh, let's get this grant. We'll distribute it to local sites. Let's get this grant. Um, and so I kind of came of age in the writing project in the early 2000s and got mentored by Janet Swenson at Michigan State and kind of 
saw this annual cycle of like, oh, every year you're going to get just a little bit more money and you're going to be able to do a summer institute and you're going to have money to send people to annual meeting and do all this stuff. Cool. Went to Central, started our site. That happened for the first three years and then boom, you know, the funding got cut. So I've always kind of had, and I, I was joking with my site leaders when we were in, um, uh, St. Louis this last fall and like you know I just have to kind of like extract this old writing project model out of my head and say we're never going to have the money to do the things we used to do and even if we could get that money like through title two grants or a foundation or something like there's going to be different strings attached to it so we're going to have to do things in slightly different ways um so I think for us to put a real concrete spin on it, like we said, you know, for the last two years, we've kind of been floating. We're like, oh, what's the next grant? And let's get this and get that and do that. And now there's no grant coming up this year. So this year is like, let's double down on continuity. Like we have not done enough continuity events. So we're going to aim to get one continuity event on the calendar every month. Um, we, I reached out to our office on campus that does like outreach and um, extension type work. And the bad news is they take like 30% right off the top. The good news is they do all the advertising and the registering and the, all the stuff that I was trying to do on my own earlier. So I'm like, Hey, let's see what happens. If they can, if they can drum up more, bit, you know, it's better because we have not had a, a contract with the school district for like two years now. So it's like, okay, if they can drum up the business and they can get, you know, people in seats for workshops and maybe even get a contract with the school, I'd rather lose 30% than not get anything at all. Right. And then the third piece with the grants is that I'm going to try a local community foundation um, that's been known to support education um, and see if I can get some money to do like a one week Institute this summer. Um, I saw that, but yeah, we'll see. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thanks. Cause it just, it looks really good. The, the Grace A. Dow and the Herbert H. Foundation. Oh yeah. The Be oh. oh yeah. Oh, well, and there's different. Beaver Island. Yeah. Oh, okay. so the Beaver Island thing. That's cool. That's actually, this is going into the third year. So that one's still good. Like we, okay, good. I, the Dow Foundation funded our STEM education center at CMU, and then I applied for an internal grant through the STEM education center, so that's where that money has come from. So I'm trying to do something similar. I'm trying now to go to the Mount Pleasant Community Foundation and say, hey, we've had this track record over the last, you know, 10 years, nine years, basically, we've delivered you know, this many thousand contact hours, we've reached this many hundreds of teachers, we've done this, 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 and this. We don't have any money. We'd like to do a workshop for teachers, which would be willing to help support it. Um, yeah. I think the problem is that they don't like paying for university tuition or for faculty. <laughs> they don't. And so I don't blame them um, because I can understand how that would be abused really quickly. And um, again, not to say anything terrible about my colleagues, but some people don't use their release time. And when they have projects, they don't always follow through in the ways they should. Um, and yet at the same time, where else am I? You know, I don't know. Like yeah. it's, just, it's hard. So yeah, like I said, we're doubling down on continuity. That's our like real focus as a leadership team. Like we are, we have told her we are putting a continuity event on the calendar every month this year come hell or high water, we're having a continuity event because we need to re-engage our TCs and just let them know that there are things that they can come to and we're happy to see you and let's see what happens after that because right. we just haven't been doing enough of that. So That's great. Yeah. So at first I was going to do a program of value. Well, I always wanted to do this, what I talked to you about my dissertation topic, but I'm so grateful for the National Writing Project for get paying for my doctorate that I was going to do, um, I was going to do that research later because mm -hmm. we can always research, right? And then um, do a program evaluation for the National Writing Project in New Hampshire. But all of my professors after this national thing came out last summer, they were like, don't do it. It's just, it's kind of, would be a risky dissertation to do. 
Yeah. I mean, it's hard. Uh, it, it, yeah, it's hard. And again, you know, this is a case where the National Rain Project has been strategic over the last 10, 15 years, and they've got both the qualitative and quantitative data to back up the success of the program, and yet it doesn't really seem to matter to <laughs> the people making the decisions in Washington. So um, I do understand why they would say that. Yeah. Unfortunately. Yes. But there's always room in the future. But Meg's doing a great job. We have a lot of um, teachers come from the Dominican Republic every summer for our summer institutional invitational institute, and so cool. it's it's fun. I it's weird that it's so close to where I grew up at UNH, but that just we didn't have a national writing project there. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. But the two worlds are very similar. Yeah. Well. That's good. Yeah, I mean, obviously, it's got a wonderful reputation. So hopefully, you'll be able to learn and glean all kinds of great ideas. And, you know, yes. Yeah. And, you know, ultimately, I, the way I look at it is it's about the work with the teachers and trying to help them become better at what they're doing every day. And the work will still be there, whether the money's there or not. So right. I'm, not, I'm not worried of ever running out of work. It's just figuring out how to make it more manageable. <laughs> right. All right, Troy, well, I really appreciate you for this. It's yeah. Altered great. my whole. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's generous. I, I don't know. Don't tell me that quite yet. Tell me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, you have. <laughs> Check in with me in like a year and say, okay, Troy, here's what I did. Now. <laughs> <laughs> I will let you know. Yeah, that's great. So, cool. Do you, are you, um, going to like ILA or NCTE next fall or what, what are your uh, uh, typical conferences and things that you go to? I usually go to ISTE and I just became a librarian four years ago so I've been going to all those annual okay. conferences so um, yeah. I want to get back I want was going to go to NCTE but um because Stenhouse didn't even pay for me but I had class that weekend so hopefully ILA this summer Oh, okay. so, um, Jacqueline Carabinus, who is now, who she's the consultant for Heinemann now, who works with Brett and what I used to do. She's one of my best friends. And Stenhouse isn't as, oh, I'm, let me stop. I'm going to stop this recording. <laughs>